Yes, it's me. I'm back. Yes. I started to peep into the decorations and figured that. But I had a little follow-up to that four-hour live, and clearly I have a problem because here I am back again. But I'm sure you all wanted to know that I did get the coffee stain out of my carpet in my bed, and I did make myself another coffee. Look at that triple layer with my Nespresso machine. I just got new pods yesterday, so I was so excited. Went to bed like excited about making this coffee and then promptly spilled it. So I knew you were gonna be um, really on the edges of your seat, wondering if I cleaned up that stain and if I got myself another coffee. So I decided to come back. Yeah. We know I'm full of shit. <laughs> We know that I can't quit you. So that's why I'm back. But no, I want to follow up on one story and also want to tell you that I found this at Trader Joe's yesterday. Cinnamon bun pancake and muffin mix. You're welcome. Christmas morning. So I just saw that. I forgot I found that. So not muffin, waffle, pancake and waffle mix. Anyway, so I see us making some cinnamon bun waffles. Anyway, so... I'm back. I want to follow up on one story, and then I thought, I want to open up to this Constellations book that I got in Seattle. It's like, I'm turning to a page, like, what is it that I need to re read in relation to those topics? And this is what I ended up with. Oh, doggone it, a couple of those hydrangeas are wilting again. Oh, well, they may not make it. They have a little life. Anyway, so I told you about um, this goes back to Marge. That's why I'm wearing the naughty hat. <laughs> Claiming my naughtiness. So, we became estranged. And then, a few months later, there was a family reunion in Florida. And I was so thrilled because I was going to get to go to a family gathering where she was not going to be. So, this might have been actually like a year later after, um, we became estranged. And so, yeah, I think it was like a year later. Anyway, neither here nor there. Some, some period of time after it. And so I had been sort of navigating this world. I didn't send, spend Christmas with my dad. I mean, it was tough. So, you know, Christmas was a tough time anyway. So I just kind of found an excuse. He came out for my 40th birthday, but he was trying to tag her onto that at the last minute. And I was like, dad, no. Either you're coming by yourself or you're not coming, but I would love for you to come. So yeah, it was a rough time. So there was this family reunion and she was in the hospital or had just gotten out of the hospital. So picture this. So she's in rural Mississippi where she had moved, orchestrated them closing up their home with all of our family heirlooms and stuff like that and moving to this lake house in rural Mississippi near her sister down there who's a cotton farmer, the one that I had to basically give all that land to. Anyway, um, she moved all of our family heirlooms into like a train car storage, metal storage unit that was on their property outside. And so basically most things were destroyed, including old family, um, all the, whatever, nine millimeter family um, videos, you know, movies that we had growing up, whatever. She just left it all in there and my dad too. Anyway, many years later, I sorted through every strain of mold I've ever seen in my life, green, red, bright, yellow, black, to rifle through the stuff to try to see what I could gather of family heirlooms. This is why I ain't ever going back to Mississippi, you guys. Anyway, so, <clears throat> tangent. So she's there at that lake house, probably just got out of the hospital. She was well into this disintegration of her body, and... My dad was going to Florida to another family members, like an aunt, 90th birthday party. So it was like going to be a big hullabaloo. My dad was an only child. My grandma was an only child. So any like peripheral cousins and stuff like that were um, important in our lives. And so my cousins were going to be there, who I really love being around. Most importantly, Marge was not going to be there. So I was so excited to be able to go and be with my family without having to navigate. Is she going to be there? Is she not going to be there? Do I go? Do I not go? How do I navigate that with her being there? And it was just, yeah. 
So I was bought my ticket and everything like that. And I headed out, flew from Phoenix to Vegas, then Vegas to like Orlando, I think. So I was landing and then my dad was going from where they were to pick me up in Orlando again before when anybody had cell phones. So I get to Vegas. I spoke about this on another video. I have this full blown phobic meltdown at the airport in Vegas. Nobody would have seen it. You would have think I thought I was a completely normal person just walking around through the terminal in Vegas. In reality, I was having a complete internal meltdown trying to figure out if I could get on my connecting flight because I had just taken this. And usually if I took a short flight first, the next one was better because I had like a little desensitization going on and I had the success of the first flight. But something happened on the first flight. Well, I was going through a really, really hard breakup and I thought I saw his car as I was driving to the airport and it just triggered me. So when I got on that flight, I started having a lot of symptoms. And then by the time I got to Vegas, I was in full blown claustrophobia. So the thought of getting on the second flight was, became impossible. So I went up to the counter, I think it was America West at the time, and I just lied and said, I've had a family emergency back home, I gotta fly back home. Lost the whole ticket, you know? I don't even think they gave me credit on even the return ticket. They converted my ticket into a flight back um, to Phoenix, and that was a very broken time for me, was getting back there at like two in the morning, realizing I am so broken, I can't even get on a plane. And then I missed that family reunion party and so now I'm like super exposed of how broken I am which is the last thing you want to have happen and um, not an easy time for me whatsoever and of course my dad was already headed to the airport to get me before anybody could get a hold of him so there he is in the wee hours of the morning headed to get me and I'm not on the plane because I've turned around and come home nobody could understand how bad it was that might have been an indicator of like, this is pretty bad. <laughs> you know, like I'm not willingly not wanting to go to this thing. I mean, there were other things that I, one might say, you know, maybe I didn't want to really go to that. So I was manifesting this, but it wasn't anything about where I was going or getting there or anything. It was 100% claustrophobia. It was that, only that. So anyway, so that sent me into like a moratorium on flying for a year. Like you just got to stop. You can't keep putting yourself through this. This is just, it's just failure after failure and it's not getting better. You got to find a way to get over this before. So yeah, I took a class at the airport they had for scared flyers and everybody's like, they have the pilot coming out talking about how, you know, safe the aircraft is and statistics and all that. And I'm like, I'm probably the only person on this plane that really doesn't give a shit about the safety of the airplane. In fact, like let the airplane crash because I can get out of it that way. This is 100% claustrophobia. <laughs> so anyway, um, but it allowed me to get on a plane that wasn't going to take off. So, and then they led us through like a relaxation exercise. And like I had to have a, I got to have a moment on a plane where I was grounded in relaxation and not, consumed with panic. So that was good about that. I probably should have done that every day for, you know, I wish I could have done that every day for two weeks and I might have gotten over it faster. But anyway, so that all happened. Marge was stuck in Mississippi because she wasn't going to this thing because she was, her medical condition was too fragile, but my dad left her there and he went ahead and went. And lo and behold, about a week later, I get an envelope in the mail from Marge with her handwriting on it. I did open it. Curious, because, you know, she had terminated our relationship like a year before. Like, what's this about? That woman, from her sickbed in rural Mississippi, like she's out in the middle of nowhere. The nearest city is small, but it's like 30 minutes away. Managed to convince someone to either take her or for her, purchase a get well card and sent me a get well card. Now this is a woman who didn't acknowledge my 40th birthday, Christmas had come and gone by then, um, but managed to send me a get well card and wrote in it, I was sorry to hear about your recent difficulties. I hope you're getting the help you obviously need. 
Now, to the outside world, doesn't she look like such a wonderful person going to all these lengths to send me, send me a get well card? But I knew better. This was the crazy making of being in my family because I knew exactly what that meant. I'm over here watching you and I'm over here watching you fail. And I'm celebrating it to the point that I'm sending you a greeting card because she was just having a little party over, because she knew damn well how much I wanted to go to that. She knew damn well that I wanted to go to that because she wouldn't be there. So she was celebrating. And so she was celebrating so hard that she bought me a card. But see, the gaslighting there is if I was to ever point that out to my dad, or if I was ever to point that out to the person who bought her the card or whatever, they would think I was crazy because she's just concerned about you, Kathy, and just reaching out. Why can't you just accept that? So I never said anything to my dad about it or whatever. My therapist obviously knew the game that was going on here and I tore it up and threw it away. But um, that calculating, that... Um, Enjoying someone else's pain is what I see in Wendy Adelson. And maybe that's why I recognize that in her. Maybe that's why I'm so alert to that in Wendy, because I do know that personality trait. I mean, I'm the first to admit, I am celebrating the fact that Charlie Adelson was convicted and he's uncomfortable. I'm thrilled at the fact that Donna Adelson is miserable and... I enjoyed hearing her franticness. I'm not above admitting that. The, the, um, but that's very different. I'm not pretending like I'm not feeling that way. I'm not pretending like I'm in some way benevolent to these people. I'm not even pretending that I'm objective. I'm just keeping it real with who I am. So that is a little PS to that story. And so I opened this because I thought, oh, I need something else in my head. And I promise you I will get into my day and I say, I promise you, I promise me. So maybe this will, I just sort of glanced over it, but I thought I'm going to read this into my life. It's David White's book that I just bought, Constellations, and it's brief. So um, I just think it might apply and it might apply to some of the stuff that we've been thinking and saying about Dan's boys, who I am going to refer to those boys as that from here and forevermore. They are Dan's children. It's called Parallels. Parallels are not what we think. Parallels do not ex really exist except in a mathematical sense and accept as, and accept as an idea to play off. If it is difficult for anything in the real world to move into a true straight line, think of the impossibility of two things moving together in two parallel straight lines. In the human imagination, a parallel world is not a world that replicates the one in which we live or is its exact opposite, but one that turns and flows through many other possibilities and dimensionalities, all the while keeping company and somehow referencing the one it shadows. Sometimes I just read things and it's like, I, I hope they just filter down into my mind in some way because um, it's a lot. The parallel life is as unpredictable and indeterminate as the one that supposedly gave it its life. When we speak of parallels, we speak, therefore, of accompanying possibilities like a life or a partner we did not choose. The refusal of an uncertain other life influencing this certain and familiar present life. We evolve as much with the parallel as we do with the present, as the years pass, our relationship to the path not taken or the person we did not pursue changes as much as it does with the one we did. There are many deathbeds where the path not taken is far more real and present than the one actually chosen. The man or the woman abandoned, far more real than the wife or husband dutifully lived with for years. There's also the que question of depth. We may have taken a certain path, but only half-heartedly, without conviction, sacrifice, bravery, or sincerity. This is making me think about my father's choice. The underlying depth below our surface approach waits for us like an invitation and a reproach, an ocean seen from a cliff, an, another life informing this life. On the one hand, a spur to boldness and a deeper participation when we realize how much in this life the other life breathes, 
or on the other if distanced into the abstract, a source of shame, a life unbraved, unlived, misunderstood, no matter how much it whispered conspiratorially into our ears. A parallel life we never fully invited into our own. I really don't know how that applies, but it might in some way. And um, I just sometimes open the book and say, okay, what is it that I need to know right now? And that's what I open to, and that's why I'm sharing with you. And if it resonates something in you, that's great. Maybe I read that for somebody out there um, that needs to read that, and I'm going to think about that myself and see where it lands in me. Anyway, that's all for now. And um, I'm definitely going to shift gears into my day now. Now, getting dressed out of my pajamas, questionable. The jacuzzi's calling my name, so that may be my next step. Anyway, talk to you guys later. Love ya. Bye.